Alright. <clears throat> Video I showed you had some good info about mining and whatnot. Um, do people know why there's so much iron ore in Minnesota? Well, Wasn't there a Middle Eastern Ridge where the um, the uh, Great Lakes are now at one point? Yeah, but why is that where it is? Where did it come from? Icebergs? No. Um, I think I heard rumors that there was an old, old mountain range in Minnesota, you know, millions upon millions, of, probably billions of years ago. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't think you guys are going to get where I'm going, so I'll just tell you. Um, so, when the first life on Earth emerged, uh, under, under water, uh, and it was releasing oxygen, right? The very first plants to release oxygen. Uh, this is when our atmosphere was mostly not oxygen. Uh, and the, the little bits of oxygen that were released into our atmosphere uh, did not stay. They were, they were absorbed uh, by iron, iron deposits. Uh, and uh, there, there are these huge iron deposits that are basically related to the first, the first uh, blooms of, of, of plant life. And those, those that, when people do research of that era, era of time, which is very difficult to research as you can imagine, not a lot of stuff left over from them, they come here and then there's a little place in Australia and that's it for being able to research these iron deposits uh, that are connected to the first, very first life. So that's a little bit of a tangent. The book doesn't talk about that, so you don't need to remember that for a quiz or anything. Um, so mining towns, a bit different than the other small towns that we've been talking about. Most of those small towns that we were talking about, they were along transportation routes and they were uh, near farming communities and very agricultural based. The mining towns, mining towns have a, have a very different history because uh, they could have very quick boom bust cycles, right? Uh, or they could have, as in the case of these, actually a pretty sustained amount of output uh, of a number of different things, iron uh, ore being one of the main things. Um, and so these are a bit unusual as far as uh, mining towns go. Uh, worldwide mining towns often have boom and bust. You, you dig all the stuff up, there's no reason to be there anymore. Um, a number of our early uh, mining booms uh, were done by people who were basically con artists. Uh, there's a good example of the book of specifically planting gold. Uh, what you do is you, you take your shotgun and you buy some small amount of gold and you put it in the top, you know, and you have your buckshot. Go out to some rocks, shoot it. It's like, well, it's stuck in the rock. Okay. Uh, and then you, you call your, your assessor, right, who goes out and checks out different claims and say, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking there's some gold over here. Go, maybe, go check it out. You'll walk around and have to... to be like, oh, this looks like gold, and you'll take it and do some analysis. You'll be like, there is in fact gold over here. You'll be like, well, shock. Who would have known? <laughs> now, as soon as that guy is telling people that there's gold, uh, all of a sudden everyone wants to, to have a claim, and people are buying these small lots of land for large amounts of money that obviously they will never get back because that is all the gold that there's going to be, right? Every now and then they would actually find other things, though. Because uh, people would be digging like crazy looking for that gold. Uh, but a lot of con artists. Uh, there's actually never a whole books written about, I thought about using them for this class. Uh, whole books written about all the different kind of scams people did. Um, so, these different ore deposits, it's not just as simple as, as where it is. Uh, often, a part of the reason why some of these deposits uh, have been so consistent through time is because they're actually pretty tough to get to, and so you can't just get it all really rapidly. Uh, and so if, if the deposits go straight down, uh, well then that's going to be more time consuming, right? Uh, and very often you'll have, uh, well, not in Minnesota, in, in places in the south you have 
mountaintop removal where they'll just put explosives around the entire top of a mountain and blow it up because then you can then dig through and see if there's anything of value there after you've blown up your mountain. Uh, we don't do a lot of that, but of course, if you go to these sites, they look a little bit like uh, you've blown it up. Uh, and that's because bull mining does usually involve a lot of explosives, a lot of TNT, a lot of danger. Uh, a lot of those early miners died in, in horrific mining accidents. Um, well, the book shows about how New transportation is put in route, right? Uh, and well, and we from we saw that from the video, not only were they were they bringing uh, ore here to be shipped out, but they're often kind of dumping the residue of different mining processes. A lot of that was unmonitored for like years and years and years. I was trying to look up some pictures of early miners. One of the interesting things about Mining in Minnesota is it had a big labor movement. It had a big labor movement because there was lots of, well, there was not, not worker protections, not worker protections. So you had things like um, people who ran the mines would try to make it so that miners were paid by, by unit of, of stuff that they mined out, right? And so, well, if you had a, a bad area that you're digging out, Oh, you just don't get any money even though you worked all day? Well, the people who ran the mines were like, yes, that sounds great to us. Uh, and that was the actual deal in the very early days in a lot of this mining. Uh, and there, when I say there was no working regulations or whatnot, well, if you've been digging for 10 hours and you haven't found anything, so you're going to get zero money, you've got a family to feed, right? It's like, we're well, going to keep at it. So people, you'd have 20 hour days. Some people would be working. Uh, in areas with like no light, terrible ventilation, because the people who ran the mines, they just didn't care, you know? Uh, they considered the workforce expendable, you know? They're like, well, there's plenty of, plenty of new migrants coming to Minnesota, thought they'd be farmers, got really bad, a lot of land that's just all sand, and they're desperate for money, right? Um, but one of the really kind of interesting things was Although these miners came from all kinds of different places, lots of different immigrant groups, uh, they all really came together, even though they could sometimes barely speak to each other, they came together to fight for worker rights, uh, to, to organize to try to get things that we take for granted, an eight hour work day, uh, rules that you can't abuse your, your workers, you know? Uh, 40 hour work week, weekends off, Things like that uh, that we take for granted uh, were in big bl bloody battles sometimes. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, and I didn't mention, uh, well, there are lots of lawsuits about different claims and whatnot, especially when the whole method of, of planting gold or different valuable things was figured out. Uh, people would want to sue and counter sue, feel like they were scammed because they were. Uh, or if there were claims uh, that perhaps someone sold and they didn't think it was valuable, found out that it was, uh, they would try to find out a way that that paperwork maybe uh, could say it was not legitimate or something, uh, especially if you were, uh, had a lot of money and you could do that kind of a court battle. Uh, some of these uh, mining towns, especially in the far north, uh, as the mining itself has kind of dissipated a bit, they've tried to switch to different things. Uh, tourists, uh, a lot of small towns in general try to try to get tourists in, but it's kind of like a mixed bag. It kind of depends if you're kind of in an area that's scenic over by, you know, Lake Superior or something, or or uh, connected to the Boundary Waters. Uh, maybe you could get some more tourism. In general, small towns that try to pivot to tourism, they're competing with hundreds of other small towns who basically look really the same and are also trying to do the same thing. Uh, so it's not a real big money-making method for a lot of small towns. Um, these are, and these are just pictures, I, I Googled pictures of, uh, well, in this one specifically, the Masabi range, uh, just to see what they look like. Um, so these aren't from the book or anything. Uh, either are the, the old mining pictures.
but this is when people think of the range. Uh, this is the type of area. Um, taconite, right? And, and most of these things have to be processed because they have impurities. Uh, because, well, when they, when they formed in their, their historic uh, time frame, whatever else was kind of around and got mixed together, well, when you, when you dig it out, you gotta separate that stuff out. Often, the stuff that you're separating out could be toxic, right? And you're dumping it into a body of water or something. Well, I think our video talked actually a good amount about that. Um, when people think about mining in Minnesota, uh, make sure you don't uh, think of coal mines because we don't really have that. We not that we get from our, our neighboring states, um, but we do use a lot of coal. Uh, yeah. Not to sound like an idiot, but what's pig iron? Pig iron. Um, that's a good question. I believe it's basically it means it's it's less processed, right? And so. Usually these days, uh, if we have iron, we're gonna process it and make it into steel, make it into something that is a stronger metal, right? Or even mix it with other things. Uh, so there's not a lot of things that just raw iron is used for, uh, I believe. Oh, I was looking up uh, images from uh, the mining and whatnot. Uh, so a lot of the, 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 the mining uh, unions, uh, the organizations were international uh, uh, worker rights organizations. Uh, the IWW stands for International Workers of the World. This is someone who apparently thinks that, that strikers were just lazy, uh, which is a bit of a, well, you know, Working 20 hour a day is not super lazy. Uh, wanting to make a wage that you could actually survive, uh, can't blame them. But that's why if you see IWW, and our book specifically talks about the international workers of the world, but it wasn't just uh, mining, it was also uh, textile workers, textiles being clothing. Uh, and they, were, they also had very bad worker abuses uh, internationally, these are international union organizations. I don't know how how active they still are. Uh, different different labor organizations have different amounts of how radical they are. Uh, the IWW, well, in the strikes that it would do and stuff, it was saying that it wanted workers' rights. Uh, they did actually have the longer term goal of. Uh, having the workers take over the economies of the world and not having uh, basically capitalism as we know it. Uh, they had very strong aims in that direction. Uh, and that's part of what the, the critique of business owners of them was that, well, trying to say that they're a bunch of crazies who practice arson, riots, uh, shoot guns, and the strikes were often bloody and there were gunfights uh, people heard of uh, Pinkerton Security? Ever heard of that? Like it's a modern day security firm. They got their start as strike breakers, as stri strike breakers. So when, when there's a strike, you guys know why people go on a strike, right? Like if you're at a place uh, of, of business, right? Let's say it's a factory uh, and they're churning out product. If you stop working, right? Well, then they're basically losing money because they're still paying for the equipment and everything. But this is the thing. You can't just a sit down strike, a classic type of strike, but you need to have a picket line so that they don't just hire other people because then, you know, they just keep on going. Uh, and so there would be a picket line and you have signs. You'd say, don't, don't be a scab, which is someone who comes in and replaces a striking worker. Uh, and so you would pick it and try to block when they would, the, they would try to ship in new workers, you would try to block them. Uh, the Pinkertons would usually come in with clubs and try to beat everyone unconscious because uh, then they could bring in the new workers to, to break the strike. Uh, so very often the strikers would then, you know, maybe pull out a gun. Uh, explosives, well, they're 
Uh, a lot of the strikers are specific anarchists. Uh, I know, uh, well, you'd have to look up the philosophy of anarchism. It's not just about blowing everything up and, and having chaos. Uh, a lot of them just wanted worker rights. But the anarchists uh, were not above blowing things up if they had to. Uh, there was a big example in the Haymarket. Well, getting too much off of a tangent here. Uh, Oh, and I looked up some of the uh, worker organizers, specifically in the Iron Range. Uh, Elizabeth Flynn, not mentioned that much, but uh, one of the main things, well, hopefully I'm, I'm getting my facts together because I was trying to read all this without glasses, but um, people who are able to, when it says solidarity, to bring together these really diverse immigrant groups who often, like I said, could not actually speak to each other because uh, it was all different languages uh that is that's that's how they they got things working is that a pinkerton because the club was um no i think that's supposed to be her and that's oh. not done very well um all right that was a pro one that was yeah pro -union. one of the one of the few pro union ones um yeah, and there's a documentary actually about a number of these strikes, but I could not find a copy. So I'll keep on looking because now we're out of good documentaries now that I finished up the our nice Minnesota uh, landscapes one. Um, so let's see, a lot of, a lot of, or um, John D. Rockefeller uh, became kind of one of the big uh, financial interests, obviously not just in Minnesota, but in lots of different states. Uh, I don't suppose anyone, um, Anyone seen the TV series Deadwood? I've heard of it and know a little of it. Uh, although that takes place in the Dakotas, that, that covers a lot of this history. Uh, it's a very bloody show, though, a lot of gunfights, so I'm not saying. I was just curious if anyone is playing too old for you guys now. Um, well, let's see. Uh, our book talks about how uh, a lot of the Finns, specifically the Finnish immigrants, were the strongest labor organization. Uh, well, because they had strong unions where they had come from, and they were just trying to remake the same type of thing here. Uh, right. Like I said, I was looking at pictures of different specific uh, places. Uh, let's see, I'm not gonna go through all these different little strike facts. Uh, let's see, there's, I kind of have discussed most of this, right? Yeah, I discussed, uh, advocated the overthrow of capitalism. And these are, these are, this, these are all big things of dynamite. Uh, like I said, a very dangerous job. Um, one of the big strikes that is often discussed is the one of uh, 1916, because that was kind of one of the more uh, successful ones. Uh, and each of these different large conflicts, often the 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 bosses would make a number of 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 uh, overtures, and they would they'd offer a few things up. Uh, so it was a piecemeal process. Uh, let's see. I mentioned the wanting to not have the contract labor anymore. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So when you're mining uh, and you're paid for how much you dig up, that's a value. Well, some of the bosses like do know where there's more or less ore, and so then you could bribe them, even though you're making hardly any money. It became this whole system of graft, where you would give presents in order to be able to have the the opportunity to work in an, an uh, area of mining that would have stuff that you would actually be able to get. All right. So as always. Gonna have you guys work on a couple of questions in small groups. I'm gonna come out and have you draw cards so that get you visiting and talking to some new people, maybe. You know, new people do what they have to do to get by. Okay. Yeah. Well, they put too many cards together. So we don't have the booth. We'll have a folder today. But we'll see. Is this your card? No. Well, you're wrong. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put it up 
playing poker. I have a bad hand so far. Don't tell everyone. Alright. We'll see how what size these different boots are. I have a horrible belt. Alright, who has diamonds? Who has diamonds? Oh, there's kind of a cluster over here. Diamonds. How about hearts? Hearts. Small group. Maybe just this this aisle. Maybe just the three of you. Uh, how about? Oh, actually, I should stop this. <laughs>